Hello, everybody. Again, this is uh, Educational Change uh, Sauna from Harvard University uh, Graduate School of Education, episode number 11. And what you see behind there is the uh, uh, symbol of Finland, Finnish flag, and it indicates that we are trying to follow the culture and tradition of this small, tiny Nordic nation. Normally, after a serious day of work, we sit down in the sauna and we relax and talk informally about important things. And Today, the, uh, the topic has been, we have been speaking about PISA, OECD PISA, and particularly the, the 2012 results. Uh, is PISA a, a kind of a useful instrument, what we can learn from that, and, and so on. And I'm very happy to have a special guest again here. We have uh, teacher Ken, Ken Bernstein, with us from uh, Mar Mar Maryland. I teach in Maryland, yeah. I teach in Maryland. And then we have two lovely students here. Could you introduce yourselves to, to the audience here? Hi, my name is Anna Maria. I'm a Harvard graduate student, and I come from Athens, Greece. Mm -hmm. And my name is Mingyan Ophelia, and I'm also a graduate student in our International Education Policy Program here at Harvard. And uh, I'm from China. All right, so we have a very international uh, Finnish sauna here this uh, this afternoon. Now, this time, I would like to ask uh, Ophelia you to probably kick, kick off this conversation and, and, and throw in the first item question, what should we talk about? Uh -huh. So I, I've been thinking about this, Posse. Um, I've been wondering whether PISA and how influential it's been in the world of global education reform nowadays, whether it's really done more good or more harm in the past decade. To the world or to, to, to me? To, to the world. <laughs> to the, you know, I, I, first of all, I think this is a, this is a great question, whether the, whether the OECD PISA has been a good thing or a bad thing. You, you know, we have, we have already 12 years of history of the OECD PISA, and I, I think it's a good thing probably to, to answer this question by looking back the time before we ever had the first results of the OECD PISA. And, uh, and I, I think the answer to your question probably depends a little bit more from where you come from and, and which side of the, 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 uh, the world you are looking at this thing. But I can tell you one thing, that when um, we didn't have the, the first OECD PISA results published yet, uh, the, the situation in Finland, first of all, was that nobody was expecting anything out of this result. We are actually thinking that Finland will be where it has always been before, somewhere in the, in the middle of the uh, uh, countries, in the middle of the Europe, in, in terms of how, how good our school system, uh, system is. We had a lot of criticism because of this at that time. People were saying that the, the quality is not good and we need to have uh, different schools for more able and talented children and uh, we need more private education and we should do something that the the other part of the world has been doing more standardized testing and standards and all sorts of things that so that Finland would look more like a world. And uh, when the first PISA results came in in December 2001, um, obviously it changed everything because it kind of approved that the, the policies uh, focusing on equity and equality in education. Uh, investing a lot of our money on special education and well-being and happiness and health of kids had actually been able to bring good results. So we often, in Finland, we often say that the, the OECD PISA, uh, in, a, in a way, saved the Finnish school system from turning into something that many others have been forced to do. Um, and, and that's why I think as a Finn, I, I, I would say that for the education in our country, the OECD PISA has been a good thing. And it, it's been, pro in, in a way, providing a kind of evidence that the, the things that we have been doing uh, in, in way of uh, investing in teachers and leadership and, and equity and equality that I mentioned have been the right choices in our policy. But I, I know that there are people who think differently about these things depending on uh, where you look at this. What, what are the other people? You come from Greece and, and you have a different view well, well, yeah, a, a lot of the criticism have to do with the misuse and the, of the PISA results, especially by media and the politics, and and also the fact of the matter that it really is testing two specific subjects, specific skills at a specific at one age group. So, given that, and given that um, there is a lot of uh, different factors that can affect a country's performance in the PISA results, like we discussed in class. It can range from the poverty levels to the curriculum objectives of a country, 
Um, and putting this all together, what would you recommend or suggest on healthy ways to, for countries to address the, the PISA results, especially mm -hmm. countries like the U.S. who are so concerned with the ranking and racing to the top? Well, we have Ken, Ken here. Ken, Ken can probably say something about the, the United States here. But I, I think one interesting, you know, one of the questions we had today was that why the why people are not criticizing pins and pearls that are kind of a similar similar global test tests and, and measurements. But there's a lot of criticism on, on PISA. My my answer often is that what the OECD is doing through PISA is that OECD is directly recommending policies. They they are saying what the country should be doing and uh, following how they should even reform their school systems. There are a lot of good examples here in the United States where the OECD is actually advising the U.S. government what to do to get there. Uh, whereas the, uh, the the Tims and Pearl studies uh, have never done that. They simply publish their data and say that you know these are the results, and it's more used for research purposes. For the universities and researchers are then analyzing and saying you know these are the findings. So, so I think um, you know we probably should treat PISA also a little bit more as a kind of a research instrument and just uh, accept that there's a lot of data there and we can look at many aspects of education system rather than comparing systems to uh, one another and try to understand what works. But Ken, um, how do you see the situation here in the United States? The problem in the United States, this is why I went through the history like goals 2000, we will be first in the world in math in science by 2000, which of course we were, is you take a raw number that is less applicable of two things. One, you cannot just look at ranking because the where you are in your rank may not really be an indication because the score and differentials in ranks sometimes are not significant, which is something that we tend mm, to agree. Yeah. Second, anytime you take a gross number, um, you hide things. And one of the few good parts in intent of No Child Left Behind was to require you to disaggregate scores by racial groups, by English language learners, by special ed, etc. The problem is originally they allowed states to set the size of the minimum groups, and some states said, oh goody, we'll set the groups as 25 oh, we only have 23, we don't have to report. Mm. The person who insisted on that disaggregation, and it's an idea that goes back to Bobby Kennedy, according to Diane Ravitch, was George Miller, because he saw Hispanic kids in his district being ignored because the overall scores of school systems were good. So you weren't using test data to inform what you were doing. Now here, I want to be very careful. Tests of any kind can inform. As a teacher, how students do on my test can inform me that they don't understand it, or maybe it was a bad test, but it gives me a reason to go and look. Mm -hmm. What a drive bothers me is this notion is that test data should drive what we do in education. All we can do is be informed by it. We then need to analyze, just need to see what we've got. And the problem I see with PISA in terms of the United States is it's being used as a stick to try to force certain approaches, even though those approaches have yet to have a research base right. to show that they work. Absolutely. Ophelia, let me throw this great question back to you. <laughs> what do you think yourself? I, I'm a little bit skeptical mm -hmm. as to any sort of ranking or benchmarking because I'm skeptical about the human tendency to use that as a stick, mm -hmm. precisely as you have described, Ken. Mm -hmm. We've talked about how um, there are five volumes of research products that um, PISA produce every time they run a test. There's a volume on equity, there's a volume on policy recommendations, there's volumes on creative problem solving and trends that are happening in global education. And how few people actually read those things yes, um, yeah. and, and try to learn from them. But you see all over in newspapers when they quote, okay, Shanghai kids ranked first again, and Singapore and Korea and Finland. Um, I think there is this tendency to oversimplify things. Mm -hmm. And when you put the number in people's hand, you're giving them the ability to oversimplify it even further. But wh wh where do these leak tables then come from? When if everybody's saying that they are not good and uh, 
you know, I agree with you that just simply compressing all this massive amount of data into three league tables, where did they come from? You're going to have to ask, ask Andreas that because he's the one who puts them out. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, let, let, let me say one, one thing that you, if, you, if, you, if you read the first, the, the, the 2000 piece, of, one, one volume, there you can see, you open the report, you see, the first thing you see is the league table. Mm -hmm. But now when you go, look at the, the even 2006 and 9 volumes, at least 12, you have to go, you actually have to look for, before you find this league table where the countries are rank ordered. And I, I think that in, in this way the OECD has done a good job, that they have kind of a down, tried to downplay this thing. So I wouldn't, probably it's, it's, it, it is the OECD that is, uh, you, you know, to, to be asked this question. Well, uh, the you United, know, I, I, United States would insist on it. After all, I don't know, in Finland, do you have students with their class ranking? No. Okay, in my high school, at any given moment, a student can go online and see where they rank in their class out of whatever it is we have. I guess it's about 350 students right now, or 400 students right now. Yeah. Exactly where their grade point average is of the last quarter, yeah. cumulatively, put them in their class. Yeah. We obsess about ranks. But what, what could we do to make better use of this, uh, this data that we have through the OECD PISA program? Is there anything? You, Anna Maria, or I, th I think we should we should really work on the communication from what the research says and the data that comes out in the evaluation of OECD and how do we communicate that to the public mm -hmm. and the policymakers and the politicians and and how that is presented um, for us to then use and evaluate and and. That can come from magazines to blogs to from you know Twitter every media means that we have to work towards a fairer communication of what OECD and PISA actually is finding. Mm -hmm. you I, said would, I would very much agree with that. Yeah. I think people first have to understand what the test actually is. You know what what are the questions that are on the test? What the, what is the test demonstrating? what section did the countries choose to take or not take before you can really compare. Right. Um, I would raise what OECD did this time, which I think was very good, is to show you what the disaggregated data meant. If you went back, mm. if you went back three years earlier, it wasn't readily evident and you had to do a certain amount of digging. Now it's fairly evident you are able to see it and understand it so that you are then able to say, okay, we're not closing certain gaps, okay? Now, what is it we're doing in policies um, that are not closing those gaps? In other words, you should be able to use the data to inform rather than go, chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the U.S. is falling from 7th to 9th. The U.S. has never been number one. And unless we address our overall issues. One other thing is, if there's, I have a criticism of PISA, it is it pushes us in the direction of one universal approach to right. how we consider the function yeah. of education. Context and I think, I think this is a mistake even in the United States. Yeah. Celia, you started this conversation and you can have a last word. Hmm. Wow, that's a... Uh... So heavy responsibility. You know, the, that world, you gave us. the world is listening. Here, <laughs> so you can say the last uh, last truth about the uh, what we should be doing next. I think I think what we have learned in this educational change class is precisely what we ended on context. Context is very important, and and what we can use PISA to do is to draw from successful experiences of high performing countries and also successful reformers uh, from all around the world, but really dig deeper to see what exactly they're doing that makes them successful and not, um, and also look at it holistically on a system um, systematic level. Um, yeah, to see what, what about their country makes it so that these practices are successful before um, we take these lessons and implement it in our own countries. Right. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the conversation and debate will continue. I thank very much Anna Maria and Ilya and, and teacher Ken for this. And you can uh, follow us on Twitter and join us next week again. Uh, one more educational change sauna. This is Harvard University. Good night.